Welcome to the stage, Delane Easton. Delane Easton. Superintendent, how are you? Nice to see you. Nice I'm to great. see you, too. Thanks. Thank you for making time. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be with you. So, uh, thank you for making time to talk with us about housing. It's a huge issue in California, um, I think now more than ever. And um, we'd like to just have you start up by uh, talking about what you see as the priorities. Um, like to get a sense of what you see as a solution to California's housing crisis. So, if you could outline what specifically um, legislatively you would plan to do in your first year. Well, first, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see this amazing turnout. And I will just say to each and every one of you, I have been in local government. So I was on the Planning Commission and subsequently on the City Council in Union City, California, when we were the fastest growing city in Alameda County. We used redevelopment money to buy up three properties that were formerly corporate yards three big properties that had toxic problems. And because of redevelopment, we were able to clean them and build affordable and, and uh, market rate housing, multi-story. It sells out like this. Every time a unit is built, it goes because it's a half a block from the BART station. Literally, if you live in one of these units, your kids can walk to high school, to elementary school, you can walk downtown, or you can walk to the BART station. So I'll just tell you that we need a lot more uh, of that kind of attitude again. Bring back redevelopment agencies in the state of California, first and foremost. Use that as a way of uh, acquiring and cleaning and making properties available for affordable and market rate housing. Second, you need a full court press in terms of housing. Look, the, one of the biggest years we ever had in construction in California was 86 when we built over 300,000 units. People to get up and say they're gonna build a half a million units is good I don't know what they're smoking exactly, but, but the bottom line is, if we could get up to 300,000 units a year, we'd be doing something special, because we've done that before. So we got to get serious about not just market rate, but affordable housing. There's an urgency in California right now. You have the largest number and percentage of homeless people in the entire country. And yet we are 49th in our in ability to build units. So we need to move up to the top 10 in our building of uh, housing. We need to get back to 300,000 units a year, and then we need an urgent plan to get the women and children and the mentally uh, challenged off the streets of California. And that needs to be a priority of the next governor. It needs to happen immediately. W longer term, we need long-range planning. You know, the state makes every city and every county have a long-range plan. So when I got elected to the legislature, I asked to see the long-range plans. Most of the consultants looked at me like I had rocks in my head. And then I got to Water Parks and Wildlife, and they said, well, we do have a long-range plan. It was done under Governor Brown, 1957. It was Pat Brown. That's the last water plan California built. So the reality is we need plans for construction of affordable and market-rate housing. We need a plan to build a lot more housing next to transportation hubs. The reality is that we have pe people say we're going to build it next to jobs. Well, good, good on you. But you got couples. One goes north, one goes south, one goes east, one goes west. You can't build next to every person who's working. But you can do a lot to acquire and redevelop lands around transportation hubs and make it possible for people to get out of their cars. In Europe, people are actually given credit for some of the time they spend on trains when they're going into work because, in fact, they're able to work on the train. And so California needs to be much more nimble about its commitment to affordable housing and much more encouraging about market rate housing. It needs to be a, a real full court press. And if we could get a million and a half units built by 2025, it would be a big step in the right direction. And that's realistic. But you don't even have enough people to build 500,000 units a year in California right now. We don't have enough tradespeople who could do that work. So let's be realistic. Let's aim for 300,000 units a year, and let's do it fast. What kind of investment do you think is needed, and how would you use that investment to deliver on that promise? Well, I do think you need an investment, and I would, I would argue that uh, right now in California, we need to give people incentives through redevelopment, but we also need to look one another in the eye and say it's really time to uh, 
free up some of the money in California by having a revisit of Prop 13 as it relates to commercial and industrial property. Right now, you've got properties that haven't been reassessed since 1978. Disneyland is paying what they paid in 78. We've got large corporations that are, that are not paying their fair share. And it was not envisioned that this would happen. Many people just assumed that when 50% of the stock turned over, the property would be reassessed. But the Board of Equalization ruled against that. And so right now, the, the estimate is that the schools of Richmond have lost $100 million because Chevron has not been reassessed since the Prop 13 passed. And so let's put more resources on the table for education and for housing by changing Prop 13. And the simplest way to do it is to make it like 1.5% and reassess every 10 years. But in fact, we do need more resources. By the way, when it was passed, it was said to be helping housing. At that time, housing paid 54% of the property tax in California. Now housing is paying 72% of the housing. So we've got to get a fair share out of commercial and industrial. We are below the national average in terms of commercial and industrial property tax. And it puts new businesses at a competitive disadvantage. If you built a new restaurant across the street from somebody who'd been in business for 40 years, your property taxes could be 20 times what that, new, what that older restaurant is. So it's a competitive disadvantage. It's also, if you remember the ghost ship fire in Oakland, it's giving an incentive to people to change, keep the outside looking the same way, but then make changes in the inside that may not be safe. Politically, even if we could get past Prop 13 and all the challenges that might come with that and redevelopment, it's still just an encouragement to local cities and counties to make the investment that's needed in terms of construction. And I think there is no secret that there's, there's tension between cities and counties and the state with regard to local control. Um, how would you balance that not in my backyard phenomenon with um, the need to build the housing units that are needed? Well, I do believe we have to do get rid of Costa Hawkins, which is the rent control uh, limitation. The fact is that it hasn't worked. Everybody knows it. It's the elephant in the room. We need to be sure that we can, in fact, give incentives to locals to provide affordable housing. And that means some of the things that have already been done and some other things that need to be done to absolutely allow us to speed up this process to build more housing. You all know that there are, I, I just met a, a fairly well-off gentleman who runs a nonprofit, and his son has just moved in with his wife and two kids into, the, into his ex-wife's garage. He's redeveloping it, but he, got, he lost his, his apartment to uh, conversion to condominiums, and in fact, he was homeless with a couple of kids in Walnut Creek, California. Not a poor person, well-educated person, has a job, but got two little kids. So now he's remodeling his mother's garage. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got to get streamline the process for building affordable housing and market rate housing in the state of California. It's taking five, six years to get approval on some of these projects. So it does need to be streamlined and NIMBYism is real, it's alive and it's well, but once you look, wake up one day and you have the most homeless people of any state in the union, you really ought to say it's time for us to get nimble here. At what point, <clears throat> at what point should the state step in if city, if locals are not doing what they should be doing in terms of making the arena allocations pencil out? I think there have been some efforts to streamline and speed up uh, by the legislature and the governor. I think there ne more needs to be done. I do believe we have to have an honest conversation with one another about affordable housing. And a lot of people want it to be over there, but it needs to be here. It needs to be everywhere. It needs to be all over California. And so, in fact, there should be additional steps taken to speed up the process of approval for affordable housing. And it's, it's an urgent need for California. There's a state legislative proposal right now from Senator Weiner from San Francisco, and it would essentially circumvent some of the local controls with regard to the approvals process for new construction and really try to speed up development in city centers near transit. Where do you stand on that? I support Scott Weiner's bill and his effort. I think it's time. It's over past due. Okay. Um, California, as you mentioned, has lost more than a billion dollars with, uh, with the loss of redevelopment and some, um, some drying up of state housing bonds. Um, what other kind of permanent, do you see another kind of permanent source of funding necessary, even if the, bringing back redevelopment is possible? Well, I think redevelopment would be a big step in the right direction, but I think the state does need 
to be more active in terms of providing resources for locals who are willing to build affordable housing because we're in crisis. And I don't know about you, but I have never in my life some, seen so many women and children on the streets. This is unhealthy for children. It, is, it stifles their brain development. And in fact, Los Angeles Unified estimates it has 17,258 homeless kids. But you all know the high school kids don't like to admit they're homeless. So the number is likely much higher. That's an, a startling number for one school district, admittedly the biggest in the state. But that is more homeless kids than there are in some school districts. And so it's time for the state, yes, to give more incentives and more stimulus and, and you know, frankly, to do some urgent things, whether it's small houses or whether it's vouchers for people to be able to go into hotels and motels. It's encouraging people to add uh, homes on, if they have large properties, add second homes or granny flats at the back of their house. It needs, we need everything we can do. Are we talking about, sorry, we're, I just want to speed it up a little bit. We're running a little low on time and I want to make sure we get to some of these major points. Um, in terms of a permanent source, are we talking about, can Californians expect to see a housing bond you know, every four years or would you be willing to maybe go to the general fund for a permanent source? I think it's, it's more likely a housing bond, but you know, there are some options that we do have. I mean, you could do a revenue bond and d identify a stream of revenue to build housing. We are one of 33 states that produces oil. We are the third largest oil producing state. We're the only state that doesn't have an oil severance tax. If you went to the public and you said to them, we want to do an oil severance tax and we want to use that as a stream of revenue for infrastructure and housing, I think the public would go for it. Great. Um, you, I think, are the only, from my reporting indicates, the only uh, candidate for governor who has uh, um, unequivocally supported repeal of Costa Hawkins. Um, that's not without extreme political challenges, even if Michael Weinstein can get the fun funding for the signatures that are needed. How would you address the political challenges and the massive amount of money that it's going to flow in to fight this? Costa Hawkins was passed because they said that it was going to create more affordable housing. The elephant in the room is that they were absolutely dead wrong about the effects of Costa Hawkins. It's also time to have a con on conversation about the Ellis Act. There are apartment buildings being converted into condominiums that should not be converted. And so they're not safe as, as uh, individual units. They don't have the kind of protections that condominiums typically have in terms of firewalls between units and other things. And so, you know, you can't just whistle past the graveyard. You can't say, well, the economists say. There's some economists that say Costa Hawkins is a good thing and they're not paying any attention to the elephant in the room. And then there are some honest people that understand that it hasn't worked and it's time to repeal it. So it sounds like you're acknowledging that there would be really extreme challenges financially and politically. I, I think there are challenges, but you want to know what a challenge looks like. Look at California coming out of the Great Depression and the, and the greatest war in history. They built the finest educational system the world has ever seen, not just K-12. We were fifth of the 50 states in per pupil spending and we built the finest university and college system the world has ever seen. We built, well, in our spare time, we were building housing that was affordable and we were building infrastructure. <clears throat> the amazing freeway system. <clears throat> My dad was from back east, he was from Kentucky. And he used to like to say Californians are people born somewhere else who came to their senses. His relatives would come and visit us from Ohio and from Alabama and from New York and from Illinois and they would just rave about the California freeway system. And they would rave about the amazing, uh, wonderful neighborhoods and opportunities that we had. If they could do that coming out of the Depression and War, a bunch of blue collar people that didn't hardly have two nickels to rub together, then we by God can create housing for the next generation of Californians. If we could turn uh, lastly to homelessness, um, it's a huge problem and I think the poverty rate in California is higher than any other place in the nation. Uh, it's not just you know, your Vietnam veterans and people with substance abuse issues who have, who have um, succumbed to this problem, it's teachers, um, it's working students, it's young families. Um, as a proponent for educational investment, what kind of responsibility do you think schools have in addressing the homelessness problem? Well, it's hard to put it on the backs of schools because they have a big challenge called education. But I will say that working together with schools, we need to identify children that are homeless. One of the challenges when children are homeless 
is they tend to move around a lot. So they may bounce from school to school and the teachers don't even know what their needs are of some of those kids. You know you're in trouble when you're on the front page of the New York Times above the fold on a Sunday about a woman that got kicked out of her apartment in Oakland so they could condominiumize it. And she winds up living in Stockton. She gets up at 2.30 in the morning. She has a three hour commute into work. She works for eight hours, has an hour lunch. Three hour commute home, do the math, it's a 15 hour day. So it's time for us to understand that the ones who aren't homeless are in untenable situations in many cases. But the ones who are homeless, I have to say, shame on us. There is no other first world country that has the problem that we have. And it's really time that we do a full court press, especially to get women and children off the street, especially to get our veterans off the street, How? especially to get our mentally, mentally ill off the street. It means that we have to send a lot more, spend a lot more time, attention, and resources actually building and, and making available units for people to live in. Some like the tiny homes, some like vouchers for hotels and motels. There's a variety of things we have to do urgently, but then there's a lot more things. The Swiss used to treat drug addiction as if it was a crime, and they locked those people up. What about permanent supportive housing? Well, one of the things the Swiss did was treat mental health problems as if they were mental health problems instead of crime problems. So I will just say to all of you, we need to get a lot more aggressive about getting out into the homeless communities and talking to people about what their needs are, why they're there, what we can do to help them to get uh, housed. I'm sorry, what was the... Uh, permanent supportive housing, if you... Yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of permanent supportive housing for people that are homeless, but I also want a longer-term solution of affordable housing for people and their families and our veterans and our, our seniors. And by the way, today the face of poverty is a woman with a couple of kids, but in 20 years the face of poverty is going to be this elderly. We have to do a lot more housing for them, too. Uh, that's all the time we have. If there's anything else you want to say to close... Well, only that I'm thrilled to see this room packed, and I hope you will be as nimble as our ancestors were in making California the golden state that it once was. What good are we if we have this terrible problem with homelessness? And with that comes hepatitis A outbreaks. With that comes a huge fire that occurred in, in Southern California because of a, of a homeless encampment that was trying to stay warm. There's a whole host of downside risks if we don't address this aggressively and nimbly. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you.